The following is an original audio series from Sierra International Machinery, Pile of Scrap, with your host, John Sacco. All right, welcome to another episode of Pile of Scrap. Today, I'm here with the Director of Safety at Sierra, Felipe Guerra. Felipe, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thanks for... uh Really uh, excited to be part of this and uh, looking forward to it. So, yeah, so your first go on Pile of Scrap, Yes, huh? first time. I've been seeing all the episodes, and uh, I knew we were going to be doing one. I just didn't know exactly when, and uh, it's not time to get ours done. Well, yeah, you know what? Listen, <clears throat> safety is uh, such an important part of what we do at Sierra, but in the recycling industry, the waste industry, every aspect, safety has to come first. But I got a quick question yes. for you. Your last name's Guerra. That's your family name. Yes. What war was your family fighting? How you, uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's uh, Guerra means uh, a war uh, in, in uh, Spanish. Um, yeah, it's a, a very interesting last name. So, are you a are you Spaniard or are you original uh, from the the Mexico or Central America? Your your family. Was My dad's side of the family. Uh, there were some Spaniards and Germans. Um, they came in during the war, and okay. um, that's where I know our name came from. Okay. Well, all right. Well, came from the war. Right on. <laughs> well, all right. Well, Felipe, listen. Um, quick background. Um, you know, you came to, to Sierra, and your background, you were doing stuff in politics down in Mexico, and you came to Sierra. So you went from suit and tie to jeans and steel toes. Quite yeah. a transition. Big change. So tell us about your first job at Sierra. My first job at Sierra was in the Canaria. Uh, I was referred by a friend of a friend that told me they were hiring a recycling facility. And uh, I came over, I applied, I spoke with our, uh, our, our manager back then and uh, interviewed. I brought my resume and I remember uh, after seeing my resume, he told me, we probably don't have what you're looking for, but we have an opening in the Canaria. And I told him, I was already aware of that opening. So I told him, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm here, I need a job. I want to go ahead and start working. And uh, I was ready. So I started working in the Canaria. So how did we get you, pull you out of the cans and throw you into safety? How did you get, how did that transition happen? Well, first of all, when I started in the can area, I was doing a lot of translations too. That, so that's one of the things that I started helping management out. And I think that's how they were able to, uh, I did a lot of interaction or management back then. And then I started helping our environmentalists. I was doing some of the stormwater sampling. He was just having me do little things here and there for him. And our safety manager too was help, was, um, uh, Having me helping helping him with the inspections and getting some of the paperwork out. How so, many years ago was that? That was fifteen years ago. You've been here fifteen years. Yes. You're just a kid. What were you? Seventeen when you came? How um, old were you when you? No, came? I was twenty five. I was already twenty five. Okay. Twenty four. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so now you're the head of safety at Sierra. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your certification certifications that you have. That's a tough word. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have? What tell uh, us about. What makes you the director at Safety, safety in your background? Uh, my background, I have a lot of, um, I'm the training trainer in multiple fields. Uh, bandlift, uh, forklift, uh, OSHA 10, OSHA 30, and there's a few others. Um, other trainings in uh, radiation. Uh, I have an OHST. I have a ASP, wow. CSP. Okay, now wait a minute. You're getting fancy with these acronyms. <laughs> OHST, Occupational Hygiene and Safety Technician. Yes. ASP, Associate Safety Professional. CSP, Certified Safety Professional. Yes. So you're certified. Yes, I definitely am. Well, I know. It's Look, taken a while, but it's 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 been a it's been a fun road. Very interesting. Careful when somebody says you're certifiable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know what? Look, let, let's get down to the meat and potatoes about safety. Our industry. When I was chairman of ISRI. We were the fourth deadliest industry, the recycling industry. I think we're number five now. So we've actually done better. Yes. So when you handle, since you handle safety, it's here. What what is the most and one, number one most important thing that you would say every company out there has to have? Uh, the If I would have to put one as the most important one, which there's plenty of important ones out there, uh, would be lockout tagout. Lockout tagout because of the type of equipment that we have, uh, that all the, the the industry in general has, it has a lot of equipment that has the potential of having life changing events. Well, lockout tagout so is taking a machine and making sure that it cannot operate. You're actually putting locks on it so it can't be energized. Yes. Why maintenance or repairs, adjustments, adjustments whatever. So 
A lot of deaths occur because people don't do that, right? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, Too many. You, people climb into machines that crush cars, cut things in half, and they don't think they're going to get hurt. That's the craziest dog on thing. Unfortunately, uh, the people that usually get hurt are the experienced employees, and many times it's even the good employee, which is sad to say, because it's the employee that knows the equipment, that feels that he has a pretty good grasp as to how the work's done, that knows how to get things done. He's the one that feels very confident and feels that the machine, that nothing's going to happen, that everybody assumes he's there and, and, and no, nobody's going to press the button. But things happen. And unfortunately, they happen too many. Much too How often. do you take that assumption out? How do we take, we're staying on lockout, tag yes. out, because that's where most people get hurt. Okay. There's other things from trucking and forklifts, and we'll yeah. get to that stuff in a second. Staying on lockout. How do we keep the human element? How do we prevent somebody from being lazy um first of all is training 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 and training uh we do quite a bit of training um we do different levels of training too depending on the level of responsibility we make sure that our mechanics the employees that get to apply the locks and tags are highly trained their training is not easy we we, we force all of our employees to pass their training if somebody doesn't pass it they got to go through training again and uh, the trainings, uh, our training stand, our our training levels are set quite high. So we need to make sure that these employees understand what they're working with, that they know what's being done. So we do hands-on training. Uh, we even do a mock-up test where we set we now set is up. That pro- that, is that <clears throat> after they're hired, or is this prior to? Because I'm gonna stay on lockout, yes. tag out for a second. Okay, so if. Lockout tag out is applied, and I always like one of my favorite safety reminders or tailgate meetings. Tailgates are where everybody gets together yes. prior to the start of the day, or if they're doing the repair and maintenance, they have what they call a JSA, which is job safety analysis. So if they're doing all of that job safety analysis or tailgates prior to every day, it keeps it fresh regardless of yes. all the training. Yes. Is that what you recommend? Yes, we recommend doing the. Uh, you gotta do the. You gotta do JSA. The JSA is gonna tell you what's gonna happen that particular time of the day. I mean, what's gonna happen? What the employees are getting ready to go into. So it, it has to be done on a uh, right before you start the job, and that's the only way you ensure employees are aware as to what's going on. You keep employees in the areas they're supposed to be in. That way, you 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 get rid of the wanderers, the people that might be able to get in there and maybe press a button or, 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 or move something. And that's what we were really concerned with. All right, so death and in- injury for the lack of lockout. What other aspects of the recycling industry ha- that are are the ones that are creating deaths and injuries? What uh, Besides getting in a machine you're not supposed to, what are the areas? Heavy equipment. Heavy equipment, uh, the, being, being, the, struck, being struck by equipment. Front end loaders, Front forklifts. Front end loaders, forklifts, unfortunately. People get hit, why? I'm not paying attention, um, backing up, no backup alarms, um, people people just being distracted, unfortunately. Phones are a huge factor. That's why you gotta have policies on that. Um, speeding, people rushing, um, even housekeeping. Um, sometimes people are going through stuff, they'll step on a piece of material, piece of, piece of material will go up and hit an employee. People being too close to equipment. People assuming because you have a cap that's open that the operator can see you, and that's a false sense of security. When the operator is moving a piece of equipment, he's focused on that tip, he's focused on what he's moving, and everybody around them shouldn't be assuming that that he's aware of, of everything that's going, that, that is in his yeah, surrounding. Yeah, you know, we, we had a good friend, uh, it would go nameless, um, owner up in Canada, he got ran over by front end loader, and the injuries he sustained, they didn't know if he would be able to walk again, and he is, and, um, I think it's being too comfortable with your surroundings. Yeah. Should never be comfortable. Is that what you would recommend? Definitely. Uh, it, it, it's an environment where you got to always be paying attention. You always have a customer factor too, which customers don't have the training. They don't know what's going on. Customers have, once again, the, the customer is not concerned with the facility he's going into. He's just coming in, dropping off his material. He thinks it's going to be a quick trip. We've seen it usually even in the summer. You get customers coming in with their kids. And kids get off and now. All right, all right. Let's let, let's yeah. let's go. All right, you got off. Now. How do we control that? You know, there, there, I see this across America. Yes. You know, I, I've done a lot of traveling. You're right. Summer times, kids aren't in school. They get in the car and they got their sons, their daughters, and they pull up. To, and kids get out and they start wanting to wander around. How do you prevent that? You basically, our employees have to. Your employees have to have to be trained on how to handle all of our customers. Basically, we got to make sure we control where our customers are at. 
either in the vehicle or they're going to have to be out of the vehicle. They got to be they got to be in the spot that the, a designated safe location, zone. safe zone. Yes. You know, that always unnerves me because kids can jump out of a car and start going. Oh yeah, real quick. So I guess you have to have the greeter. You got to have your staff very aware of their surroundings, what's going on. Um, pretty much after the customer ensuring that we control where he's going to be at. All right. At all times. So, we got lockout, tag out. If that's applied properly, we can prevent injuries and death. Being aware of your surroundings and having your backup alarms and not being comfortable with moving trucks, vehicles within your facility can prevent. Yes. Let's talk about trucking. Yes. A lot of deaths, a lot of injuries with trucking. How do you train truck drivers? How, what, what do we do? How, how, we, how is... How does the message get out there for that part of the thing? For the truck drivers, we do, first of all, we do defensive driving. We, we well, let me take it a step back. We test them when we're going to hire them to ensure they know how to drive, um, that they are good drivers. Uh, we do the, the, the background checks. We check. We ensure it is the, 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 the person being brought on board knows what he's doing. So you're doing his background. You're seeing what kind of uh, driving record he has. Yes. Okay. And red flags. What? We won't hire what? What's the um, what's what's the what's the standard that we won't hire to? Pretty much drivers that uh, DUIs, drivers that have uh, speeding violations. Uh, one speeding violation or two? What what was the measurement there? One. One. Yes. If you have one, you're not hired. They're not because once again, I mean that's not the type of, of driver we want on the road. We don't want that. When you're driving a, a commercial truck, that's a lot of responsibility. You hit something, and more than likely, it's going to be smaller than you, and you're gonna, and whatever you hit is going to be losing. So that's, once again, we got to keep we, we, we got to keep the public safe. Yeah, another horrible story. You know, a friend of mine, another friend in our industry, um, a truck pulled out in front of a family, and um, the car, the trucker was at fault. The mom became a paraplegic with three kids. It was a seventeen million dollar case. Thank God they have the insurance. But that's how quick you can come to work and you own your business. And in five minutes, your whole business is in jeopardy. So defensive training. We have, yes. Is that a program we have? Is yes. that a program we subscribe to? Who teaches defensive driving? Uh, or the safety team. Uh, we have uh, several safety advisors. We have three safety advisors. And we train our, our employees. 90% of our training is done in-house. So we ensure that these drivers are trained and before they go out driving. Uh, when they're starting out, we assign another driver to mentor them and teach them where we go, how we do things, our procedures, our steps. So, okay, so hold on, I'm gonna go for this. So yes. we have a, we, what do we call it, a drive along? What do we, a drive along, what do we call that? There's a term uh, we... Yes, it's a drive along basically. It's, it's, it's um, all of our new employees are SSCs. So, uh, well, what not, does sorry, that mean? Not, not, not a short service employee. All of, our, all, of our, all of our new hires are looked at as, um, we mentor them. We, we keep them in the green hard hat for six months. During the six month period, we are we keep a really close eye on them, making and sure so they the know drivers, how to get you, the job And so the drivers, you you assign done. a somebody who knows how to drive to be. So you got to yes. Like going to driving school when you're fifteen and a half years old, and you have to drive with it. Pretty much that's what we do with so them. So we're monitoring that they a really know how to drive. You yes. put them through tests, and so now there's something we do at Sierra uh, that I really like: it, the journeyman plan. Right. Yes. Describe, what, what is the journeyman plan? Where did it derive from and how is it implemented? The, our JMP, that's as, we, uh, as, as all of our employees refer to it, our JMP journey management plan. Um, it's a plan that we've developed. So we instruct our drivers, the routes they're supposed to be driving. We, we tell them how to get from point A to point B. And these routes have been pre-verified. We ensure that the trucks can uh, drive these, these roads, that it's legal for them to drive through those uh, locations that they will have the right clearances, right permitting, because we, we haul around our own sure, equipment we, too. when we do heavy hauling, yeah. Um, we ensure that the the roads are, are gonna be safe and also that we don't expose our drivers to excessive, uh, uh, let's say school zones. We try and avoid them. We don't okay. want our trucks driving in front of a school zone. I, I, uh, yeah, well, not only that, it just slows you down. Oh, yes. And then we also have, we avoid the left-hand turns across traffic for the big commercial trucks are concerned. So you don't do left-hand turns without a signal or you avoid that, you gotta make a lot of right, eventually you gotta make a left turn someplace. Yes, we avoid it wherever there's not a signal. Obviously there are locations where we might be forced to based on design, but wherever we can avoid it, we do it. In fact, 
just for our trucks to come into our facility, they have to take a course and come back around so they can drive in. Well, I notice that all the time. If I'm out front, I see one of our trucks going by <laughs> because they can't make that left turn yes. into Sierra because there's no light. So they go down, they take a, a ride at the light and go down and, and they follow the road around and they make their left at a left turn signal. Yes. So they, they're drive. So we're going actually the extra mile. We are definitely to ensure safety. Yes. Commercial trucks move much slower than the regular vehicles. Unfortunately, many, many, many motorists out there don't have that respect towards towards a commercial truck. So uh, we we've had everybody's had it. Commercial trucks being cut off, and you have a motor vehicle accident. And unfortunately, many times in the eyes of of, of the DOT Department of Transportation, it's the driver that's at fault. And it's quite uh, difficult when you get these vehicles that are. 1,500 pounds, 2,000 pounds just cutting off commercial trucks. Yeah, that's... Uh, and when that happens, it's, it's a collision waiting to happen. So we avoid those scenarios as much as we can. Well, you know, you taught me something. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're putting the homeless shelter next to Sierra yeah. on a busy thoroughfare in front of Sierra. Yes, unfortunately. And there's heavy industrial trucks running up there from cement trucks to uh, fuel trucks carrying full loads of diesel, full loads of recyclables. And you, ta- you taught me that a fully loaded... 80,000 pound truck of recyclables going 45 miles an hour, which is the speed limit on Brundage Lane, takes 250 feet to stop. 82% of a football field. Yes. That, that's a long stretch. And anything that's in... You know, it's funny. Minutes. We know it. But all these people driving, you know, just a regular civilian car, or yeah. if you, they don't know that. The trucks just can't stop on a dime. Yeah. That's that's crazy. So, you know, that's um, so we've covered lockout, tagout. We've covered about being struck by um, moving vehicles within the facility, and we've talked about the trucks out in the field because everybody, yeah. not everybody, but most operators in the recycling industry have all three of those situations. Yeah. So that's a good start. So let me ask you this. We have the safety program, and you and you. I asked you to give me some notes about how people can start. But what you said is, do not uh, buy a pre-made IIPP, which is Injury Illness Prevention Plan or Safety Program. You say that will get you in trouble. Why? There's many of those out there. There's a huge market. They're quite easy to, to access. You just have to do a little quick Googling and you'll find companies that are selling them. They're very generic. They're too generic. They have a lot more information that applies to you. Uh, and when I mean to you as a, a, any business that, that purchases it. So when you have uh, an agency coming in, they're going to be auditing you on the items that are non-existent and that will get you in trouble. And I've seen too many, I've met too many colleagues in the safety field, especially uh, people coming into this field, that they've gotten themselves in trouble because an auditor comes in and, and they're right, asking you, questions you, and right. stuff. All right, you, you said aud- auditors and agencies. At Sierra, we have, they all come in. <laughs> We've had Ocal OSHA, we have Weights and Measures, DTS, Department of Substance Toxic Control, Air Pollution Control Board, Water Board, know, Water Board, and, City, and we have all these County. things. They, and, and we've actually done well. Yeah. Because why? Tell us why we pass these inspections and, and what do we do? This, because I think people need to hear this. I know what we do, but yeah. I want you to tell people who will listen to this podcast. What is Sierra doing to prepare for these type of inspections? First off, the key, housekeeping. Housekeeping, housekeeping. It, it, that's, that's the key. Being really clean and organized makes things so much easier for everything else you got to do. Well, my dad, remember, my dad's yeah. nickname was Mr. Clean. My <laughs> dad was a drill sergeant in World War II, and he was nicknamed Mr. Clean, and he always was a neat freak, even at home when I was a <laughs> kid. You couldn't have, you had to, before you could go to school in the morning, you had to make your bed. So, but housekeeping. Why? What, 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 what happens when the, the inspectors come in? Well, I would tell you this. First of all, when they all come in, um, and, and you see it on all the letters that I, I keep forwarding over to you, we right. get a lot of kudos, a lot of compliments on the cleanliness, the, the organization of the facility. Most of these auditors and inspectors aren't expecting a clean recycling center. They're, they're expecting, expecting to walk into a junkyard. Yes. They're expecting a lot of stuff all over the place, spills. They, they expect 
an organization, and they don't see it in us. Man, you know, safety, we're, we're, you know, this, there's no way in this podcast we're going to be able to get to everything, but I think we're going to touch <laughs> on general stuff. Housekeeping, making sure you have a spill plan, so when something spills, hydraulic yes. oil, oil, you have a cleanup plan. And so housekeeping, for anybody who's listening, if you want to do anything to keep an inspector from just going nuts right off the start, organized. Yes. Don't have oil, don't have puddles of water with oil film on top, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. What other things do we do to pass these inspections? We do that. We're really, um, we have a lot of our signage, a lot of the... Uh, signage. Talk about that for a second. What kind of signage? We have signage um, that pretty much informs our employees on some of our rules and policies, speed limits, um, what's allowed in certain areas, the um, we have signage for the uh, areas they're not allowed to be in, some of the products that we store, right? Uh, where everything goes, we, we we try and keep everything very organized. The and other the other day, uh, Felipe, we had the um, um, the inspector from the fire department. Yes. And one of the, what they wanted to see was documentation. Yes. Talk about documentation and how that helps an inspection. The documentation aspect. Um, makes your makes the inspection so much easier when the inspector comes in and sees you have all these documents stating your inspections that you're doing what you're supposed to do there i mean once again it's it, it makes everything so much easier for them uh, and they really well they're, they're, when it. you document when you s- tell the inspector this is what we do and then it's documented yes they know it's it's taking place yes. yeah they can see it for instance if it's far it, like this last inspection they were they were checking a lot of fire equipment um, our storage of our, our, our sprinkler systems, and they were able to see the tags on the equipment, the markings on them, the inspection forms, and they see the real inspection form. So it's 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 a they have the proof there. They're able to see it. They're able to compare it, and and once again, it just makes things so much easier. Um, and and some of these inspectors coming from other facilities, I mean, they they're always letting us know, hey, this is so much easier coming to inspect you. I mean, this is easy. Well, that's kudos to you in the safety department, but it's a culture here at CR. Yes. Keeping the yard Mm -hmm. clean. Now, look, we have a lot of customers who come from all over the world to visit Sierra because, you know, the equipment sells. And when they come through our yard, we usually pretty much get the same, you know, people are usually surprised how clean our yard is. You know, but you have to do it. It's a discipline. It's every day. Yes. So housekeeping, documentation. What else can we do to help? What else can you do to when you have these inspectors come in? What else can companies do to help prevent them from just getting, you know, throttled by inspectors? Because they love to come in and find, find things. Yes. Um, well, starting with that first impression, you walk, you walk them through, show them what, they're, what they got to see. Keep it short and simple. I mean, they're looking for, they're, they're going to give you a list of items they're looking for. You got to take them to those items and... And if you're able to show them what they're looking for in an easy, precise manner, it's 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 a piece of cake. All right, so it's an in and out. Well, you know, ISRI, Institute of Scrap Recycling. You know, I always talk about ISRI. Look, as a former chair, you know, ISRI's done a lot for CR. We learned a lot from ISRI, haven't yes. we? Okay, one of the things that ISRI put out years ago is how to survive a ocean inspection. OSHA yes. inspection, and. We have. We, we survived one. It wasn't that many months ago. We had the, the Cal yes. Ocean in here, and they were, they were in here like four or five days, and they only found a torn tag they didn't like and didn't particularly care for a guard, but we fixed it within a week, and we really didn't – we had no issues with them. Well, in fact, we had the guard done before the inspector left. We had it done well, how you wanted it, but we came above and beyond within the week. So I would say, <clears throat> and you would probably say this to me – when the inspector comes and he wants something changed, you do it right then and there, yes. right there. When you have an inspector, he's, he's going to be your focus. And you got to let them know that it's very important. I mean, we take it very importantly. So when they show up, I make sure they know that safety is very important for us, that safety comes from the top. Uh, and all of our employees believe in it. So as they're, if they find anything, we get it fixed right there on the spot. I mean, I, I notify the right people. We tell them, hey, we need this fixed. And many times I'm showing them the picture before they even walk out of the gate. Here it is. Things got moved. Things got uh, done as they were supposed to be done. Well, look, they want to see com- they want to see compliance, but they want to see a willingness to comply. Oh yes. Because what they don't like, 
is they come in, they inspect something, they ask you to fix it, they come back a week later and it's not fixed, you're in trouble. And, and I will tell you this, I've been told by otters before the, uh, when I've had little one-on-ones and speaking with them because after they've been telling us so much they like our facility, uh, the, the thing they worst hate is when you lie and you start coming up with all these excuses. It, they don't like excuses. If something's wrong, let's fix it, let's get it done. They don't want this whole story on how this incident occurred. They just don't care about it, they just want it fixed. One thing that happened, we, we learned, and, and we do it on a regular basis, is every button in an electrical panel in a facility has to be labeled. Yes. And during the one inspection, during this time, we had like one panel that was missing a couple, you know, <laughs> you know, descriptions of what it went to. But we had the electrician out here. We had it fixed during the time of the inspection. Yes. And so it's, there's no excuse. It's not there. Call the electrician, get them here, label it. And that's what they like. And the other thing that they also see is they're seeing that all these other panels are labeled. So they know it's, it's, this is this one scenario, this, this one single event. So that also makes a big difference. It would be very different if we had 50 panels that weren't labeled. But when they're finding just one and it's only part of the, part of the breakers that are not labeled, they know it's something that's, that might have been overlooked. It could have been uh, a little bit of weathering. Uh, so they understand too. So that also plays a big factor when it's just a couple items. When they're finding something constantly, that's when you get yourself in trouble too. Right, I agree. Okay, we were talking about ISRI and how to survive the ocean inspection, but we are part of the ISAC, yes. the ISRI Safety Environmental Council. We attend these meetings. Yes. Tell me something that's, tell me something you were able to learn. The number one thing you learned from an ISAC meeting, and I want you to tell something we showed everybody because we were sharing information. Tell us the one biggest thing you learned going to an ISAC meeting. There, uh, there's been so many things I've learned out of uh, out of the ISAC meeting. It's first thing that comes to your head. Uh, first thing, guarding. Uh, there's been many types of guardings that have been shared among some of the, some of the members. Uh, in fact, originally that's the way we guarded that that machine that was uh, that we had uh, the issue with with Calosha. Um, the original guarding we came up with was out of the ISAC group, and, and it had, still wasn't good enough. Yes, did it? and we had and we had OSHA inspectors there too that were speaking on behalf. So of So are guarding. we going to share our 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 how we resolve that yes, issue? Yes, we, we already shared it. Uh, we shared it with the group. Uh, it's a really good group of individuals. The networking networking there's phenomenal. We 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 do so much sharing. Uh, there's emails going back and forth every week, uh, multiple emails. Uh, we can ask questions, and, and the nice thing is people that do what we do. Yeah, well, and absolutely. So it's, that's a golden opportunity. Anybody that's not doing it, they're losing out on something you, that's... You know, Isri's motto is safely or not at all. Yes. But that's the first sign you see when you <laughs> drive in Sierra, safely or not at all. Why? you got to know it. It's got to be yes. part of the culture. So, look, we, we, you know, Felipe, we're, we're going to have to talk. We're going to have to do another podcast on safety because we got to... So, but I want to talk about... A new hire. Yes. Now this drives me nuts. I'm sorry. It's an <laughs> owner of a company, but it's I understand it. But yeah. a new hire. Tell us how long it takes for the new hire to finally get out on the floor and go to work. For for my department to get one employee, uh, in, to get them into orientation, there's several steps. Uh, everything from physicals, uh, background checks, and there, there's a lot of steps. When they walk into orientation, it takes us a full week to start. That would be a general employee, a full 40 week, hours, 40 hours. We take them a full week where we teach them everything from uh, the, the, the safety, the, the personal protective equipment, our rules and policies, uh, what we allow, what we don't allow. We take them on a full year tour. We teach them uh, what's the proper behavior in our facility. We do quite a bit of, of training. Um, I hate it, but I, I, I totally <laughs> understand it, okay? Yeah. You know why I don't like about the 40-hour training? Because you go into the room, you say hi to the people who are going to come to work, and you know, you see the faces. they just going to spend 40 hours in this class. Within the first week, two weeks, they're leaving because it's just too much for them. Yeah. The, the actual right. work. It, and it, we it, have to spend 40 hours training. They get out there, they're done. And it's just, ah, it drives me crazy. Yeah, it's, it's quite a bit of, of information. Uh, we do a lot of hands-on. We keep it very interactive. We try and give them the best view that we can as to what's going on outside so they know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it is a reality. You get some individuals that come out and once they see it's, it's hot, it's 
especially here in Bakersfield, we, we get really hot weather. Yeah, in the summertime. And, and sure. sometimes some individuals just can't handle that part. So, you know, one thing I want to tell people who listen to this. I have a friend in Michigan, young kid, and he's a good kid. <clears throat> I would see his post on social media, and he'd never wear a hard hat. I called him. I said, listen, if I see you do one more post without your hard hat, I'm going to come out there and kick your butt. <laughs> You know, just having fun, right? Yeah. But isn't it not true that if the owners of the company walk the yard without the safety equipment, that it's almost impossible for you to make the employees wear the stuff? The only reason that I feel that my team, my team, our team is successful is because it comes from the owners. It comes from the top. And if you don't have the owner buy-in, we're, we're, we're talking to the wall. And All nothing's right. going to happen. Carbon toes, not steel toes. I called you before I bought these <laughs> doggone shoes. I said, Felipe, can I wear carbon shoes, toed shoes? And you said yes. Yes. So it's okay. Yes. Carbon versus steel. <laughs> yeah, there's different options out there. <laughs> well, these are comfortable. Yeah. And I, because I, I walk a lot in the yard, when, you know, so, you know, that that's the fun part. Let me talk about, I'm going to go, you know, California, Colorado, state of Washington, some of these states now legalize marijuana. Yeah. And I get asked this question all the time. Well, if pot is legal, how can you can deny employment to somebody who tests positive for marijuana? Your response? All of our jobs here are safety sensitive. All of our, employ all of our employees have to walk out to the yard at one point or another. We have heavy equipment, moving parts. Uh, so it's, it, we don't want anybody running the risk of getting So say safety sensitive, zero, we have a zero tolerance policy. Yes. Okay, now my question is: Is has it been challenged? Is there any problems we've had, or is if you ain't know when they come in here, it's zero tolerance? We we from day one we let them know, and that's one of the first things that we cover in the orientation. We let them know we have zero tolerance. We let them know what we test for. We we do quite a bit of testing. We have randoms. We have the probable suspicion testing, we, which we we've, we've we've used that before. Yeah, we found an employee drunk the other day, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, uh, not sad. Too long ago. It's sad. Yeah. You know, but again, more training. We we let them know. They know what they're getting themselves into. And it's and inherently a dangerous business, it right? It is. It is. All right. And you as a safety director, you gotta be what keeps you up at night? When you when you you leave here, you go home and you start thinking about safety. What keeps you up at night about keeping everybody safe at Sierra? Here at Sierra, uh just making ma making sure that the we, we we stay away from the shortcuts, the the that possibility of the employee thinking they can just go in and get something done really quick, thinking that we can just get this done real quick without the lockout, without the lockout, out. without the the JSA, without following the procedures, thinking that they can just grab that stool instead of grabbing the ladder, thinking that they can just get this done really quickly. That's what keeps me up, and that's what we got to constantly be focusing okay. and training them and teaching them. All right, now, I, I got I to gotta ask you this. So you go home, you got your kids, and you're all safety all day. You must go – your kids must hate you at times. <laughs> no, son, don't swing that baseball bat by your sister. Or <laughs> we, uh, I mean, how much safety – do you take home and your wife and kids go, Dad, this isn't Sierra. Come on. Uh, I do quite a bit at home. I will tell you that. <laughs> I, I will tell you this. My kids have been taught how to use a fire extinguisher. Well, that's important. So we, uh, we have, I have fire extinguishers in my restrooms, my garage. Um, my house is – I consider my, my, my house very safe. I have the cameras. I have the alarm. I have the dog. Yeah, but do they do they do your kids think you overdo it with safety with them when they're playing? Come on, I think they're used to it now. I mean, they're I think they just it? see it as a, as normal practice. Um, when we go on vacation, we go to Mexico, and 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 not many people use seatbelts out there. So we get in the car, and my kids start putting seatbelts on, and I got other other people that know us like you don't have to do it here, and my kids are like, no, we have to. Yeah, that says we have to. Right. Well, so they they they're used to it, but but. Uh, I do throw little curveballs to them every every so often because. Uh, oh yeah, my my kids <laughs> th think I overdo it on the say, Dad, we're okay. As my daughter all the time, but you got to be aware of your surroundings. Yes. And I think that uh, look that applies to your business and to your home life and when you're out. Yes, you got to be aware of your surroundings it, at all times. And I will tell you another 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 thing that we did here with our safety. Part of our safety that we that we that we 
teach our employees is home safety too. Because if we can make them be safe at home, they're going to be coming back to work tomorrow. If we can, we can make them be safer, if we can change the culture, and that's one thing we've been striving quite a bit, we try and many times give them examples that hit home. We tell them what happens when you fall off the ladder at home. Because right. that's, that, that's when they're going to be really at risk. They know we got a safety guy here in the yard looking at them. They know we're going to have somebody at the job site and what our policies are, and they know they can get themselves written up, disciplined if they don't follow the rules and policies. But at home, that's that's where they might just be tempted to just grab that couch and stand well, and change know, the light bulb. My favorite <clears throat> safety meeting of the year, always, I love the Christmas safety. Yes. Meeting. Because it's the reward for being safe and give it. But, you know, I you and the safety team put together a slideshow about being safe at Christmas. How Christmas trees, how quick they can go, yeah. on, you know, light up on fire. And, 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 you know, so I like the fact that we tell our employees, look, safety but take it home with you you know i think that's a message again for anybody listening to this take your safety with you don't just leave it at work just because you're safe here at work doesn't mean you don't be safe on the weekends when you're driving around and look i I know people think about it but it it's all the time isn't it yes you're much more at risk to be heard outside of work than at work well felipe listen we've been at this for Long, not longer than I want. We're just going to have to do part two a little later yeah. because there's so much more to delve into, more details about safety. But I think what we want, the message here about safety is, is you got to have a safety plan in your company, right? You have to. And what's the easiest way for somebody to start? If, if somebody's starting out, I would recommend taking a, a, a 10 hour, OSHA 10 hour course. It will give you some basics as to what you're supposed to do and not to do. Once you've done that, once you've grasped that, Go to a 30-hour OSHA course. Okay. That They'll go a little more in-depth. They'll tell you on the signage and what you're supposed to do, do's and don'ts. And once you've done that, definitely, or as soon as you can, try to go to an ISAC meeting. The people you will meet there will be so much help. It's it's. You got to join Israel. Easy. Easy. Yes. Yeah, you, you, know, gotta... people, you know, it drives <clears throat> me crazy. As, a, as a, like I've said a hundred times, a former chairman, people, well, what does Israel do for me? It does a lot. And yeah. because this ISAC, the, the Environmental Safety and ISRI Safety Environmental Council, provides so much information pertinent to what we do every day. And I will tell you this. I feel that Sierra is quite advanced when it comes to safety. We have a lot. We're the, when many things we're very proactive. There's many things that we do that others don't. But still, even with all those advantages, if I can call them that way, that we have versus some of, some of the other facilities... Every single time I go to to the one of these ISAC meetings, I learn something. I always come back with business cards. Some are from, from some of the members that are going to be helping, and some are from people that are helping me out. I'm always learning something. There's always something to do, learn, something to do. There's always somebody doing something that somebody else is not doing. Right. Well, I, And everybody's I mean, the, open. The exchange of information. <clears throat> yes. It's, it's, and that will help keep us all safe. Well, you know, Felipe, thanks for the time here. Look, oh, we're going to have to do another part because I want to get into some details. I want to get into accidents that have happened yes and why they happened okay this i think is a good thirty thousand foot view of you know get started people housekeeping number one yes absolutely number one document everything you do wear your you know your protective PPE. your ppe personal protective equipment your personal protective equipment and owners if you walk in your yard without your hard hats your safety vest those two things alone. If you walk out in your yard, your employees will not follow. Without a doubt. You're going to kill your program before it even starts. If the owner doesn't follow it, the employees are not going to go, not follow along. They're not going to buy into it. They're not going to really feel that they that they should be doing it. It's a cultural thing. Yes. And once the safety culture hits, what is fascinating is how the, 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 the veteran employees do not put up with unsafe acts by the newbies. Oh, yeah. And it's really cool. All right. Well, Felipe, listen. Awesome. We got so much more to talk about, and we'll do that down the road. Maybe another month we'll, we'll, have, we'll reconvene and do more, get more details, probably gory details that people don't want to hear. Yeah. But we're going to do it. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And... All right. Well, that's it for another episode of Pile of Scrap. Thank you. Thanks, Felipe. Thanks. Appreciate your time, buddy. Thank Thanks. you. This has been a Sierra International Machinery original audio series. Thanks for listening. Please share this podcast and make sure to subscribe.